Nowadays, it's like Salem witch trials. You say the wrong thing and you're fat phobic, but obesity kills you. A huge part of my acceptance is using the word fat, taking a weapon that has been used against me and like putting it on the mantle behind me. There has been an increasing movement to really celebrate individuals regardless of body size. Each person's body is their own choice. There will always be fat people on this earth. You want to have fit abs? Great for you. We also need to accept the fact that a person can be fat and healthy. The nature of the body positive movement, these are positive things, but they can be pushed to an extreme that I think can be negative for people's health and for their overall well-being. My name is Jessamine Stanley. I run The Underbelly, my yoga studio. The Underbelly is a digital space for everyone who has felt like yoga is not for them, which is a lot of people. The yoga world definitely tends to cater to slender-bodied, ableist theology, and The Underbelly is for everybody who wants to see themselves represented in this world. Hey, how's it going? How's your day today? Up or down? It's all meant to be there. I'm glad that you took time out of your day to come onto your mat. I started practicing yoga when I was in my early 20s. It was a very alienating experience. Like, I was almost always the only fat person, frequently the only black person. All of the postures felt completely impossible to me. But I didn't realize that so much of the my anxiety and my depression was really coming from not allowing myself to live outside of the boundaries that I defined for myself. I started posting on Instagram because um, I wanted to feel like I was a part of a bigger community. The yoga people who were on there were like very serious practitioners and, and teachers and they were just like trying to, like me, just trying to find community. So I started posting my photos and immediately the reaction that I got, it wasn't other practitioners being like, hey, North Carolina, so glad to see you. Or like, I practice triangle pose too. Like, this is what I do differently than you. It was mostly people being like, I didn't know fat people could do yoga. I have quite a lot of experience with the trolls. They're coming for me for every reason. They, they feel like I'm promoting obesity. Now that I have, I talk about more things than just the traditional idea of yoga. And it is especially hard whenever it is literally like my body, <laughs> it is my physical being that is being criticized, that is being judged. When people say things that they mean to be hurtful and it comes across as very hurtful. Obesity on its own contributes to hundreds of thousands of premature deaths in the United States every year. And if we factor in its contributions to all of the major chronic diseases, the number is staggering. My interest in obesity as a public health physician is because it's a canary in the coal mine of chronic disease. Where you have higher levels of obesity, you have higher levels of diabetes. You have higher levels of hypertension. You have higher levels of coronary artery disease. You have higher levels of cancer. You have higher levels of dementia. You have higher levels of degenerative arthritis, and on and on it goes. And having this conversation during a pandemic, we also need to note that obesity is on the short list of leading risk factors for a very bad outcome if you get COVID. So it's not just a chronic risk to health during an infectious disease crisis, it's an acute threat to health. Obesity has been a really tough problem to fix because when we address it clinically, it does not alter the fact that it's actually a cultural malady. You have rampant obesity where culture does this wrong. And it's never been clear to me that clinics can fix what cultures are in the business of breaking. My name is Rebecca Poole, and I am a professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at the University of Connecticut, where I am also the Deputy Director of the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity. 
My research specifically focuses on stigma and discrimination experienced by both children and adults who have higher body weight and larger body sizes. And we look at the effects of these experiences on their emotional and physical health. And we know from many research studies that weight stigma contributes to psychological distress and poor physical health. It increases depression, anxiety, substance use, suicidality, disordered eating, physiological stress, and weight gain. I think in our society, body shaming has become very socially acceptable. We see it in multiple forms of media, especially on social media, where we're, we're at a place where people think it's fine to make derogatory remarks about someone's body. Did you see the cover of Cosmopolitan magazine that was widely criticized because they had a morbidly obese woman on who was a, a you know, like in a, in a bikini plus size model. Yeah. Yeah. And they were challenging beauty norms like this is a person that's eating themselves to death. Fat shaming doesn't need to end, it needs to make a comeback. It's what goads people into saying, maybe I can do better as opposed to, I'm always perfect the way I am, how dare you? Any time I've met Bill Maher in person, he's been nothing but pleasant and kind and nice, which is why I found it so surprising that he or anybody thinks that fat shaming needs to make a comeback because fat shaming never went anywhere. If making fun of fat people made them lose weight, there'd be no fat kids in schools and I'd have a six pack by now, right? <laughs> There has been an increasing movement to really um, celebrate individuals regardless of body size and to really stop shaming individuals who don't conform to very stringent ideals of physical attractiveness, especially for women for whom thinness has been held up in our society as the, the ideal for, for decades. We know that many of the thin ideals that we see in the media are not realistic and do not reflect the vast majority of women's bodies in, in our culture. And so the body positivity movement has been an important voice to really challenge a lot of that negativity. Pick up this year's swimsuit issue of Sports Illustrated and heads up, you'll see some serious curves. They went all the way from like a zero size way up to a 16, which is Ashley Graham. So it's making, pun intended, a big statement. Mm -hmm. And whether you like it or support it or not, whether you think she looks amazing, whether you say, hey, she doesn't belong in this magazine, we're all talking about it. You and I are talking about it. I'm Sarah Chawaya. I'm a plus fashion blogger and a consultant for brands that are moving to plus size. The morality of the word and of the concept of fatness is something that is really interesting because for a lot of people it is very much about what they've been told is bad. And, and, and they've been told it's bad from early childhood, whether it's their, their mom saying, oh, I don't want, I can't eat another bite of ice cream, I'll get fat, or seeing somebody shred for the summer, or you get the bikini body, and all these messages of, like, of what we must do to have a body that is beautiful and desirable. It's all focused on not being fat. Fat is the enemy, fat is bad. I've always loved fashion, and I did not know at that time that there was a plus fashion world. So when I discovered that, it felt like a game changer, and I wanted to be part of it. When you actually look at it with a more critical lens, you can see that fashion is something that is how people present themselves to the world. And that has so much power. And not having those options takes power away from people. Uh, for example, when I was working in a corporate law firm and I was unable to find a suit that fit me correctly, if you're, the only options that I presented to you are akin to a tarp to cover up your gross body, that's going to send a message to you about your body is not worthy of being seen, your body's not worthy of being celebrated. For me, I wanted to push to have more sizes available so everyone can be on equal footing when it comes to choosing how they're going to express themselves to the world, choosing what armor they're going to put on each day. That has been denied to plus size people for a really long time, and when people are actually able to have that same access, you can see the difference in confidence in how people feel about themselves. Bloggers like me, we're often told that we're promoting obesity and that we are hurting, hurting the nation's health just by existing and by being okay with our bodies. 2019 seems to be the year of Lizzo. But it's her message on body image that has the singer-songwriter resonating far beyond the world of music. Music. How long it took me to fall in love with this body and yeah. to fall in yeah. my butt was my least favorite thing about myself. Uh -huh. And I learned to love it. And now it's the thing everybody can't stop talking about. And I love that they're putting images out there that we normally don't get to see of bodies that we don't get to see being celebrated. And but um, why are we celebrating her body? Why does it matter? That's what I'm saying. Like, why aren't we celebrating her music? Because 
it isn't going to be awesome if she gets diabetes. In general, I don't, I don't, I don't celebrate anybody doing anything that I think compromises their health. I don't celebrate you smoking a pack a day. Doesn't make me like you any less. Doesn't make me think any less of you. Doesn't make you any less worthy, deserving, or beautiful. But it will kill you. I don't celebrate that. I was an overweight kid, and fitness was something that empowered me personally. And that's why I became passionate about fitness and utilizing it to help people live a better life. Biggest Loser is an um, is a, is a interesting beast unto itself, right? Like, when the show began many years ago, I do think it was to shame people, absolutely. We wanted to take the two biggest guys and crack them first. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. 10, you think it's gonna be easy? Greg, run. Greg, if you don't run, I will pull Alex on the floor and I will break every bone in his body. Start running. This show is at its core about helping somebody who's morbidly obese lose weight. And that should be okay. Body positivity ha is like a spectrum, right? Like everything else. There's loving yourself, but then there's I deny that I have room for improvement because I've been so hurt and so marginalized that I, I love this because it's so painful. We're like, you can't hurt me with this. It's mine now. I own this, this thing, this word, this thing that's hurt me or whatever it might be. I own it. I love it. I accept it. You can't hurt me with it. I love this. I love being 300 pounds, 400 pounds. I think political correctness is not just putting people's physical health in danger. I think it's putting our entire society in danger. We're no longer allowed to have conversations with each other. You say the wrong thing and you're fat phobic, which by the way, I didn't say the wrong thing. So don't think I'm apologizing because I am not. But you say something someone doesn't like and you're fat phobic and you're a fat shamer. It seems like nowadays, and this actually kind of goes back to the point that I originally made about Lizzo, that it shouldn't matter if somebody's thin or obese. You should celebrate the person. Because by the way, that's the problem. <laughs> Is that when you're making it about their physicality, that's when people get defensive and they're like, I love this. You don't make fun of me. I love this or whatever it might be. And it's like, you, you lost weight. Shame on you. You were beautiful before. My name is Kelly DeVos and I'm a young adult writer. I had just written this book, Fat Girl on a Plane, that was based on my experiences living through life in a fat body and some of the kind of discrimination that I felt that I had received and some of the negative experiences that I had. And it was really, it really drew heavily based on my own personal experiences. At the same time, I'd had this health scare. My doctor came and saw me and he revealed that I had type 2 diabetes, which I had never received that diagnosis before. And he was basically like, look, you have to lose some amount of weight in order to deal with this, or you're going to have to be just permanently on medication for diabetes, probably for the rest of your life. And it, it's going to have some negative impact on your life expectancy. We had a pretty serious little argument there in the hospital because I thought, you know, I feel okay, I'm active, I try to eat generally healthy, and he's, you know, and I was kind of like, look, you can be healthy at any size. And he was like, well, maybe you can be, but you're not. Look at where you are right now. So I was in this situation where I was really, really scared about my health, but I was also fielding a lot of criticism of my book, specifically about telling a story about a character that wanted to lose weight. I got a lot of pushback uh, from different people who felt that just telling a weight loss story was never acceptable. People in the body positivity community didn't want that narrative. There are prominent people that I really, really admired who were very negative about the book because they felt that it was never okay to show a character with a weight loss arc. It was never okay to show a fat person who wanted to lose weight. What I found was that I was being pushed out of these spaces where body positivity activism was happening. People that I really admired, other writers, body positive writers, fat positive writers, I was being asked to leave these spaces because 
I first of all felt that there were some scenarios where it was acceptable to want to lose weight. And so I started to kind of think that like, I, I think there is the potential for this movement to be harmful. I wanted to talk about how the nature of the body positive movement, the fat acceptance, acceptance movements, these are positive things, but they can be pushed to an extreme that I think can be negative for people's health and for their overall well-being. Because of political correctness and polarization and the fact that we are a dumbed down, soundbite, say it if you can tweet it, society, we have a really hard time dealing with two concepts simultaneously. We have a really hard time embracing nuance. Obesity is a leading predictor of health outcomes in the modern age, period, full stop. It's just a fact. It's a fact of epidemiology. And unlike all the other major chronic diseases, obesity is highly stigmatized. We blame the victim. We do not blame people for their coronary disease, and yet it's a disease of lifestyle. It has much to do with whether they exercise, whether they smoked, how they eat. It's their fault. We don't blame them, it's a disease. We don't blame people for diabetes, we don't blame them for hypertension, on and on it goes. Obesity, we look at people, size them up and blame them for it. It's wrong, it has to stop. But we also have to treat obesity as the health threat that it is. My name is Sabrina Strings, and I'm an associate professor of sociology at the University of California, Irvine. My most recent work is about the history of fat phobia in the Western world. People have to understand that for different communities in the United States, and also in different parts of the world, people have a variety of different body compositions. Some people are more muscular. Some people are fleshier. Some people carry more weight in their waist. Other people more weight in their hips, thighs, butts. For a long time, physicians have known that black women tend to be heavier than white women, but also tend to be healthier at heavier weights. The idea is that, well, by telling people that their bodies are wrong and they must transform them, we're really showing that we care about them. We want to help them. But in reality, it's just rooted in fat phobia. And that type of phobia, that type of stigmatization, only contributes to worse health outcomes. People feel like they don't want to go to the doctor. It's a form of psychic stress. And there are many different types of stressors that we can all point to. Racism, sexism, those are among them. But fat stigma also is the kind of stressor that contributes to poor health outcomes. We find that women of color often have worse health outcomes. There's a variety of reasons for this. Often it has to do with poverty. So we know that women of color tend to be the poorest in our communities, and this means they may not have the same access to health care, or it may mean that they have access to substandard health care. It also frequently means that they're food insecure, and there are plenty of studies showing that people who are food insecure tend to have higher BMIs. So we can already see how this becomes a very complex, multifaceted problem because we have people who don't actually have frequent, ready access to healthy and nutritious foods, who tend to weigh more, have less access to health care, and then the health care that they are getting, they're typically being told simply to lose weight. All of this is deeply problematic, and it moves us further and further away from diminishing the health disparities that many people in the field of medicine really care about. My name is Aaron Flores and I'm a registered dietitian and certified body trust provider. I have a practice that focuses working with clients who are struggling with eating disorders and body image issues and a lot of folks who are trying to pull themselves out of diet culture. I get a lot of people calling saying, hey, I need to lose X amount of pounds or my health is a concern and my doctor said I need to lose weight. So what I tell folks is I work from a different perspective. I work from a non-diet approach. We're going to look at your relationship with food and your relationship with your body rather than focus on just tell me what to eat. Our metabolism is really damaged through restrictive eating habits and dieting. And it takes years for it to rebound and to recover if it, if it ever does. There was this really important research study that looked at contestants from this 
game show The Biggest Loser, and, and they, they studied these folks for six years after the show, and they saw that for the same person, same age and same height and same weight, the people on the show had to eat significantly lower calories to maintain the same weight than the other person who had never been on the show. And there is research that shows that different size bodies can be in good health and that you can achieve good health through developing good, sustainable, healthy behaviors that don't involve changing the number on the scale. There will always be fat people on this earth. We can't expect everyone to fit within a very narrow parameter of what is a quote unquote normal size body. We've so normalized diet culture that we think it's liking ourselves to want to be on a diet, to want to like change, fundamentally change the way that our bodies look. Being on a diet and nutrition are like very different things because everybody should care about the fuel that they put into their bodies. Like it's not, that's not really up for debate. To say that people are just eating too many calories is so simplistic. There are so many people who've attempted dieting who, once they're done, their body has gained weight and probably more from when they started. And that's a factor in where their adult weight wants to be. I think a lot of times healthcare providers don't know what to do. Do they talk about weight? Do they not talk about weight? There are some instances of a healthcare interaction or an appointment with a patient where weight is not necessarily relevant to the discussion, but there are times when it is. And so the message isn't necessarily don't ever talk about weight, but if you are going to bring it up, let's do it in a way that is respectful. Would it be okay if we talk about your weight today? What words would you feel comfortable using while we have this conversation? That sends a very different message to the patient than a doctor pointing to a chart and telling them with a pointed finger that they're obese and they need to lose weight. I've you know, heard so many really sad stories about people coming in for a flu shot and getting a 10 minute lecture on weight loss. I've heard of clients who have been denied fertility treatment because their, their body is, um, is, is too big, they say. Just because you're in a larger body doesn't mean you're non-compliant or that you don't wanna listen or that you don't wanna have a conversation. You just wanna have a conversation that doesn't include weight loss every time. Should you love the skin you're in? Hell yeah. Will your weight potentially still affect your health? Hell yeah. We've got to be able to process both of those truths at the same time. I don't think you can say that weight loss is negative, inherently negative, um, but I think it's always anytime you are doing something to more closely conform to society's beauty standards, I think it's worth an examination. I think it's worth thinking, why do you want to lose weight? Why do you think that's prettier? Is it because that's what you've been told is pretty your entire life? Is that what's you, what you've been told is beautiful? It's just an unfortunate reality that as human beings, and maybe even especially as Americans, we live in a hierarchical society. If you're working out and you want to have fit abs, great for you, but it doesn't make you a better human being than someone else. You can be slender and unhealthy, and we also need to accept the fact that a person can be fat and healthy. I lost about 50 or 60 pounds. Um, I was able to go off my diabetes medication. I mean, as you can see, I'm still a larger person, but I feel like my size is now not impacting the quality of my life. The only way to evolve and to learn is to be able to speak and engage in conversation. Not just the conversation that's been anointed by you know, the, the, the woke. Here's my question. You're so woke. Why are you so intolerant of an opinion that's different than your own? I don't think it's a question of political correctness. I think it's a question of kindness. I think often political correctness is a term used in place of, I don't want to consider other people's feelings. A huge part of my acceptance is using the word fat and really owning it. And it feels in a lot of ways like I am taking a weapon that has been used against me and like putting it on the mantle behind me because it's something that I can own. I think that I've definitely felt like I'm not allowed to be fat and I'm getting to a place where I'm like, I am allowed to be fat.
hey, thanks for checking out CBS and Originals on YouTube. If you want to watch more documentaries, download the free CBS News app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or any streaming device. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here. Thanks for watching.